Okay. Have we finished processing, as Will calls it, in between? All good. Thank you very much to... Um, I'm Dr Sheridan Coates. I'm the Social Practice Lead at Unwalt Australia. Thank you to Jeff and Will for the opportunity to be part of the session today. In the short time that I have, I'll be providing my perspective as an SIA practitioner that has developed specialist social impact teams to undertake SIA within a large-scale project development context here in Australia. Starting out as a sole contractor in the early 2000s, my then business, Coates Consulting, grew to around 15 social scientists at a maximum um, undertaking SIA for a range of resource sector projects across Australia. Approximately six years ago, we became part of Umwelt, a specialised environmental and social consultancy, further developing the social capacity in their business. And I guess one of the key, key drivers for me joining with what is a sort of a medium-sized environmental consultancy was around the challenge of integration. And having worked independently as a social practitioner for many, for many years as a specialist, um, contracting directly to companies, I felt there was the need for me as a practitioner to step into uh, that next space and start to bring that together. I currently have a, a youngish um, social impact tech team um, at Unwell. It's a bit of a gap in the middle there, so lots of young graduates and, and some very key principals are in the audience today. Um, and so to structure my input today, I, I guess I've posed a few key questions that I feel may be relevant to our discussion and, and already is starting to see some of those themes and, and um, the next presentations will do the same. Let me see if I can change the slides. So I did my own little bit of um, social research, just a nice superficial <laughs> type of uh, bit today, and asked actually some of my youngest SIA <laughs> staff members um, what had attracted them to a role in SIA. And many of them have actually fallen into the area of SIA more by accident than by purpose. So as the slide indicates, some of the key drivers for them, and I think it's really important for to remember what it is that brings us together in this sort of field and profession. So for me, very much, this one, first one really resonates strongly and has done for many years, the ability to apply social science thinking in project development and decision making, providing a voice to stakeholders and communities, being able to influence proponents and their project design in a proactive way. And there was a great discussion earlier um, today around, you know, how early is too early and our ability. And in some ways, actually, I think 20 years ago, 15 to 20 years ago, we were having far more impact, I know, in, in the work, some of the work I was, um, was doing in that, pre, in that sort of pre-feasibility stage in influencing um, project design that maybe that, than, we're doing, than we're doing today. Promoting equity and fairness, making sure that people in the environment are adequately considered, understanding what makes communities work, what's important to them and why, and being able to assist them. And we've heard a lot of theme, I guess, around the conference the last few days around transition. And working collaboratively, and Chris touched on this with others, I guess, to achieve more accepted and sustainable solutions, because it's only through that dialogue that I really feel that um, those solutions can so what are the skills? Well, a bit of a jack of all trades, really, to be honest. Um, demonstrated knowledge, as we said, of, of theory and ability to apply such theories. Helen, gave a, Helen Ross gave a, a great presentation in a session yesterday where she spoke about how SIA has had much prescription around procedure, but maybe less in relation to the application of theory to assist us in understanding change and transition. And Richard Parsons in the, in the session this morning actually touched on that as well in looking at different types of stakeholder theory in informing when we should or shouldn't, shouldn't start the work we do. In this regard, it's been really valuable as a part of the uh, conference to hear about much of the research that's underway that can assist in informing our practice. And I know myself that my approach to social impact assessment has always been to challenge my team and team members to ensure that they are keeping current with the research that's, that's coming out of, of what we now have as some amazing research centres, but also using their experience on the ground to inform that work. 
The ability to work effectively with stakeholders, I've found over the years having strong engagement professionals in my team has been really, really valuable in adding, you know, a, a real rigour around that engagement aspect. And sometimes, in, if I look at the, the breakdown, I suppose, of the teams that um, I've engaged, sometimes people have a leaning in one way or the other, but rarely do they have all that combination of skill together. As social impact practitioners, we also hold common core values, integrity, courage, I think we need a lot of that at times, openness and accountability and compassion and empathy. And it's great to see that new guidelines, for example, in New South Wales, are finally drawing on the IAIA, SIA standards, which have been there and have been a guide to us for many, many years, to reflect the values and the principles that guide our practice. So whether we're social researchers, whether we're working on the ground as consultants or we're sitting in industry to try and bring about better change internally within, with, within businesses, or maybe it's a number of those different things, we all are using similar skill sets and values that drive our practice. I also would like us to question, you know, what are those skill sets moving forward relevant, I guess, for um, the future? and other skills that have been required by SIA practitioners today, the same ones that are going to be required for tomorrow. So just to look at my, t my team's profiles over the years, a very varied skill set. The teams which I've developed have been drawn from a variety of disciplines, psychology, sociology, human geography, social planning, anthropology, communications, engagement, community development, environmental science, business management, law, geology, and political science. So, as I said, over the years, many of my colleagues have fallen into the field. I think I pretty much fell into the field too. Wasn't, wasn't really that uh, a, key, a key career path for me, but I've been fortunate to work alongside some really great practitioners and to make a real difference with some of the businesses that we have um, worked with. So what are some of the challenges? Um, some of these will be quite similar to the ones that... Um, Chris mentioned. So first of all, difficulties in finding fully fledged SIA practitioners which have a depth of practical project experience. And I just did a quick LinkedIn search nationally, actually, before I arrived um, here at the conference, and I could only find about 59 people with social impact in their title on LinkedIn nationally. Uh, depth of practical project experience that practitioners offer across differing contexts. And over the years, we've been required by clients to demonstrate a minimum number of years' experience in SIA. And I, I remember a particular project in Western Australia where we actually, for the client, had to demonstrate 15 years of practical experience in SIA in order to be considered for the work. There's the challenge of retaining good people. Working in a consulting environment and pre predominantly with industry proponents, it can conflict with, with some practitioners' values. So where I've got some very good practitioners that have joined our, our team in the past, sometimes the work just wasn't for them. And furthermore, I think still, I still think I haven't quite got used to the consulting environment, but the cut and thrust of project work is not for everyone. So tight timeframes, tight budgets, conflictual contexts, difficult clients can take a, a personal toll. The combination of skills required in the role, so team members, as I've said, seem to have key strengths in certain areas and not in others. And Chris made this point about the need to build teams that, um, that, have, that bring together, I guess, those different skill sets. And as Will talked about more in the um, education sector, but it's really important also with teams to develop a critical mass so that practitioners don't feel alone in their practice and that there are others around to support and mentor them. And linked to that is establishing legitimacy. And there is still quite a strong perception at times that anybody can do it. And we're still challenged in relation to the true integration of our work within EIA. And we need to be continually working at better promoting our professional skill set and its values. And I really do think that that, that is um, our responsibility to do. And I've also added one that's not up there, which came out of a discussion that we had a little bit earlier around SIA capture. And I really am quite sorry to say that for the first time, um, as I say, over the last 20 years, I'm starting to see the bubbling up of public relations um, professionals back working in with um, companies that we're working in. So we haven't seen that for a long time. Used to see a bit of that at the beginning, but again, we're seeing we're moving back. And companies, obviously, a discomfort sometimes with the processes and the assessment processes that we 
that um, we employ and a greater comfort with controlling message and, and those sort of things. So. In New South Wales, in relation to establishing legitimacy, so purely in an Australian context, we do have a new guideline um, and obviously thanks to quite considerable work by Richard internally, which actually states the need to have suitable qualifications in a social science discipline and or proven experience over multiple years and competence and also membership of professional um, associations, obviously, such as IAIA, EINZ, AES. It was interesting, the inclusion of the Australian Evaluation Society, given the presentation that was given yesterday around the role that evaluation can play in SIA practice. And I think the and and the or is important here, as experience and application for me is a key requirement, irrespective of the disciplinary sl uh, slant from which we first embarked upon in relation to our SIA journey. So in terms of some of the approaches that we have used to developing our SIA consultant teams is around utilising existing networks where possible and obviously the IAIA has been terrific in relation to that and we've also had recent, got recently the establishment um, of a social impact working group for the EIANZ. Um, and, you know, often when we're busy doing the work, which is, uh, is obviously what a lot of us, us do, it is difficult to connect and share. So those mechanisms are important. We have to be proactive in sourcing graduates through university degree course pl um, placements. So in New South Wales and in the area where we're based, we've been doing quite a lot with trying to establish links with universities in that regard and to give students the opportunity for placements um, in the business prior to them finishing their degrees to see if it's the sort of work for them. A key strategy for us has, has, to, has been to train graduate and postgraduate applicants on the job, but it takes time to develop that capacity and it also requires a strong commitment from the principals in my team to mentor those junior school, um, junior team members. Always, again, that's not easy in the craziness of consulting. And developing teams, as I said, with a multiple science skill set and not being afraid to actually step outside our business and to link and um, collaborate with other social practitioners. It's about finding those with that genuine passion and making a different, to make a difference and harnessing that and hang on, hanging on to the good ones as long as you can, um, but acknowledging that that experience across sectors is, is necessary. And over the years, we've lost some very good practitioners into industry and government. Um, but many of those are still in those positions and are having um, and are, are now very strong social practitioners and are, are, are having a, quite an influence internally within those business businesses. Education and training, I won't talk much about that because um, Will touched on a range of that, but essentially um, I guess potentially there's a need for a more tailored degree course with cross-disciplinary. I agree, agree very strongly we need that cross-disciplinary um, collaboration because no one skill set has all the answer. And a key question for me in that regard is whether there is actually a demand. So just in, in um, concluding, it has been a long road after 20 years of practice and capacity in relation to the development of my teams has been a recurring issue. In closing today and thinking about the focus of the session and developing the SIA workforce nationally and internationally, I think I probably have more questions than answers. So just a couple that we, we may get to discuss at the end of the session. How can we increase understanding of the value of SIA practice in government and industry decision making? We are getting some traction at that government level, but can it be maintained? And will we see a demand for SIA practitioners increase as a result? How can we better articulate our skill set and the competencies required for good practice and gain greater legitimacy? And will further training and or certification assist? And it'll be interesting to hear from um, our presenters a little bit later around that. Do we need to adapt or tweak current certification systems for social practitioners? We know the EINZ has an environmental um, practitioner scheme. Um, so do we, can, we, can we learn and, and draw on those experiences and associated certificate, uh, certification schemes as well? And as a practitioner who is now getting old in the tooth, how can we continue to build stronger communities of practice, provide a transfer of history and learnings to date in SIA within Australia and internationally, 
to those practitioners that will be responsible for continuing to drive the SIA agenda moving forward. Thank you.